Well, the question at hand is, are science and Christianity at odds with each other? That is going to be one of the most important questions that you're going to face if all of you head off to college. Well, I can tell you this. Isaac Newton did not think science and Christianity was at odds with him. Louis Pasteur didn't. George Washington Carver didn't. Joseph Lister, James Clerk Maxwell, and all of the people who established the major areas of science that you're taking right now and you'll be taking in college did not think there was any conflict between science and Christianity. There is a conflict between miracles and science. As he told you, I'm an engineer and I'm also a medical doctor and I can tell you this, virgins don't give birth. That is a scientific fact. And another scientific fact is this, dead people do not come back to life again. We know those things scientifically, and yet if I were to ask you, how many of you believe that at least one time in human history a virgin gave birth? Raise your hand. And how many of you believe that at least one time in human history a dead person came back to life? We believe those, because those are miracles. Those are miracles. And then the next area that you're going to find a conflict is not only just between the supernatural and science, but between the supernatural and the world religion of naturalism, which is what you will be indoctrinated into when you go off to college. So a few years ago, I did a debate, and a man named hmm, Sean McDowell, any of you ever heard of him? He wrote the questions for the debate, and these were great questions. So pull out that paper right in front of you, get your pen ready, because we are going to get answers to three really important questions that you need to know. The questions were this. Question number one, how do you understand and interpret Genesis 1 and 2? You, you should have an answer to that. When someone comes up to you and says, well, how do you understand Genesis 1? How do you understand Genesis number 2? We should have an answer to that. Question number two was this, are you open and what is your take? What is your take on the compatibility of Darwinian evolution with Christian faith? What is your take on the compatibility of Darwinian evolution with Christian faith? And question number three was, are you open to the natural world pointing to design? Are you open to the natural world pointing to design? So as you can see up on the screen here, we have a whiteboard. We have a whiteboard and we're going to do a whiteboard talk. And the whiteboard is going to move. See that? Boom. And it moves and I have this incredible ability to write really fast. Write really fast. And since I did this debate in California, I wanted to be a little countercultural up there. So I started with question number three first. Are you open to the natural world pointing to design? Because this is like, this is like the scientific question that makes everybody doubt the Bible, which makes them doubt the claims of Jesus Christ. So I started with that number first. Are you open to the natural world pointing to design? And my answer to this was this. Yes, of course. I'm the president of ICR. Of course I'm open to the natural world pointing to design. And I ended up saying that the workmanship seen in living things is best explained by design. Now the key word there that you need to key on is workmanship. Workmanship, because that's what the Bible calls it. In Romans chapter 1, it says, invisible things of God are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made. Made. And that Greek word there is used only one other time in the New Testament. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, where it says, we, all of us in this room, are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. So when you look at living creatures, particularly when you, when, you, when you see those things, you should see evidences of workmanship. So, I've got this little clicker in my hand here that I advance my slides with. Do you see evidence of workmanship with this? Yes, you do. You see multiple parts working together for a purpose. So when you look at me, do you see evidence of super, incredible, phenomenal, over-the-top workmanship? The answer is, yes, you do. Of course you do. And that wasn't even a joke, so no smiling. You see evidences of that workmanship. So I want to cover, I could cover many, many areas, but let's just cover one. How organisms adapt. And look at this. What would you do if you're a fish? And you can see up there on the si screen, you have these sided fish, and then you have those blind fish. What if you're one of those sided fish, and you found yourself suddenly trapped into a cave? 
How would you live in an area of total darkness with reduced food and completely changed conditions? Well, those fish can adapt. And they adapt by losing their eyes, they lose their pigmentation, and the question is, how do they do this and how fast do they do this? Well, this has become an icon of evolution. But <clears throat> contrary to what evolutionary theory would teach, <clears throat> excuse me, and what you're going to learn in college, that this would be a slow, hit and miss, trial and error process, if you were to read the best scientific papers today, and I do, you would find adaptation characterized by these words up on the screen, regulated. In fact, the scientific papers say it is highly regulated. It is rapid, it's repeatable. Sometimes it's even reversible and with solutions that are so targeted, they're even repeatable. Now those characteristics don't sound like those from evolution. And I wanna take on three, three major icons of evolution today which they point as evidences for their slow, gradual change and show that they're completely wrong. And one of the icons are these cave fish right here. In fact, there's over 120 different varieties of cave fish, and you can see them up on the screen. They go from sighted, and their bodies completely change to what you see at the bottom part when they live in a cave. And recent research has found, and, and if, you're, if your textbook isn't teaching this, it is out of date. And if you're heading off to college and they're not teaching this, they are totally out of date. Recent research has found that these fish, and you can see the pictures of them on the right-hand screen, can change from sighted to blind in a single generation. Not over many generations, in a single generation. How does that actually happen? Well, we are doing that research at the Institute for Creation Research. And this is a picture of our Discovery Center there, and it's only 20 minutes from this location. And if you were to come and visit, you would see our lab, our cavefish lab, and you would see the research that we were doing on this to delineate the mechanism of how these fish actually change from sighted to blind, and how they can go from pigmented to hypopigmented, or better yet, we can take surface fish, and we can see how they change, and we can take these cavefish, and we can see if they can go back to pigmentation. And we can find that they can do this very, very quickly. I can't emphasize enough how important it would be for you to make a trip and read the scientific evidences there because we cannot cover it all this time and see exactly how these changes are being made. And you can actually see the laboratory where our research is being done. Well, here's another icon of evolution, finches, and you all learned them as Darwin's finches. And you heard the story that, you know, they struggle to survive and when they have these big seeds, they get the big beaks. When they have small seeds, they get the small beaks. And that they're all fractioned out through a struggle to survive where we have winners and losers. Incorrect again. Research has been studying two populations of finches near the Galapagos, urban finches and rural finches. And urban finches are eating human trash food. And the rural finches are eating the traditional finch food. And they found that with these finches, their beak could change and other parts of their body could change within two generations. Two generations, and they're not genetic changes. It's not changing your genes. It's changing mechanisms that can regulate the expression of your genes while you're in development, and they can rapidly change. They're called epigenetic mechanisms, and you can see the quote on the screen that it says these epigenetic mechanisms are a means to enable creatures to not slowly change over really, really long periods of time, but to rapidly adapt, rapidly adapt. And all of you have those same kinds of epigenetic changes. And if your textbook is teaching you that your DNA is static, that you're born with and it doesn't change, it's out of date. We now know that your DNA is dynamic and it can actually be changed in real time. It's not read-only memory, it's more like read-write memory. And it enables you to rapidly adjust by some genetic changes and many of these epigenetic changes. And this is the cutting edge research that is out there. And most of the textbooks, and I have to say, by far the vast majority of the professors are decades out of date, decades out of date. Now you've also heard the story of the peppered moths, that they had all the white moths and then the British people started producing their soot and polluting things. The white moths took out like a sore thumb as the birds ate them. Another death-driven view. Wrong again. 
This research was published a few years ago indicates that there's a mechanism to change their color from white to black. And there's a piece of DNA which can be cut out and it can be moved and relocated to another place on the chromosome and pasted in. And when it pastes it in, it changes the regulation of the pigmentation and 96% of all of the black moths have this piece of DNA, it's called a transposable element, that has been pasted into the section which controls the black color and 0% of the white moths have it. Not a slow accumulation of changes. In fact, this piece of DNA is over 20,000 base pairs long. It's huge. And all of this we know to show that we have an ability to have rapid changes. Here's another one. This is a fish. The man holding there is a predatory fish called pike. He's up in Minnesota. They love to ice fish up there. And that pike will eat a bass, it'll eat a trout, or it'll eat a carp, whatever's in the lake. And as long as it's eating a bass or a trout, the carp don't care. But as soon as it eats one of these carps and it digests it, and you see the little red dot there, that's the expressing the little carpy vapors into the water, those other carp in the lake can detect those digested particles and within a day their shape begins to change so that they're taller, faster, and harder for a pike to catch. Within a day, rapid morphological changes. And I guarantee you, you will not hear about this when you go off to college. They're going to be telling you the same old, worn-out story over and over again of slow, gradual accumulations of genetic mistakes. But these fish can change rapidly. Here's another fish. It's a reef race down on the Caribbean. The brightly colored one there, the green and the blue is the male, the yellow is a female, and there's usually about one male to about 12 females in the little group there and that male services those females. But what happens if a fisherman comes by and fishes that male out? Or if the male dies for some other reason? Remarkably, the females can detect that the male is gone. And not only that, they can detect which of the females is the biggest female. And within a day, her ovaries regress, she grows testes, and she morphs into a male. Wow. Wow, that's quite incredible. Okay. All right, it's not that incredible. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I can just hear, it's like what females have wanted to do for a long time. Anyway, morphs into a male. Quite remarkable. Here's another one. This is if you go into biology, this is what you're able to do. These, these researchers took a bunch of male mice, not the female mice, they took the male mice, and they put them on a metal pad that could shock their feet. It could shock their feet painfully, but not lethally. And then they exposed these male mice to cherry blossom odor, and they shocked their feet. Exposed them to cherry blossom, shock their feet, expose, shock, 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 shock. You get the message. So if you go into biology, you know what you're doing. Then they took these male mice, and they mated them with female mice that had never been exposed to cherry blossom odor ever. And she had pups, and then these biologists sacrificed the pups immediately upon birth. Wow. And then they stained them through the olfactory region, and the stains are looking for olfactory bulbs and nerves. And that's what you're going to see on the next picture. On the left-hand side are the olfactory bulbs and the nerves of the controls whose dads were not exposed to cherry blossom odor. On the right-hand side, with the dark blue stain, are the bulbs and nerves of the offspring of dads who were exposed to cherry blossom odor. There's over a 200% increase in the olfactory bulbs, and guess what they're specific for? Cherry blossom odor. In one generation, one generation, if you're being taught the slow, gradual accumulation of mutations, you're three decades out of date. That is old and that is backwards, and the recent scientific research shows that creatures can adapt rapidly. And how do they do it? They use the exact same mechanisms, the exact same parts as a human-made adaptable thing works. So you see up on the screen there a cruise control. 
And cruise controls have to have three essential elements. They have to have a speed sensor, a logic mechanism, if-then logic, if you begin to slow down, then speed up, and then you have to have an output device to control the throttle. Organisms adapt by the exact same three parts. All of you have literally millions of sensors in your body. You have thousands of sensors on each cell. Your cells are programmed with logic that if, if you detect this, then respond in a different way. And you have output responses that can change you rapidly, sometimes subtly, sometimes physiologically, sometimes over multiple generations it can do this. And they are using the same corresponding elements and parts as a human-designed adaptable system. Now that is strong evidence that you and every creature was supernaturally created. And not only that, the traits don't show up due to the challenge, just like any good engineer would do it. The traits are built into the creatures up front. In other words, the solutions to the problems that you're going to face and other creatures are going to face are built into them in advance. Solutions precede the challenges. That is radically different. That is very different from what the evolutionary worldview would say is the solutions are due to the challenges. No, 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 no. The solutions precede the challenges. And as we're working with these cave fish, we're finding that they have mechanisms to turn on their pigmentation and turn it off very, very rapidly. And they exist prior to the exposures that we're putting them under. So this is a really radically different view. And if you don't remember anything, you remember the guy who did the talk with the slides that moved all around the screen and he had a whiteboard. But I want you to remember something different to fundamentally change the way you see creatures. What you are, could be taught and what you will be taught when you go off to college is that creatures are basically very, very plastic and moldable and creatures are shaped by their environments. They're essentially passive modeling clay which are being shaped by their environments. Wrong. Remember that, that's what you'll be taught. But what you just saw today is the exact opposite. Creatures are not passive modeling clay. Creatures were designed by the Lord Jesus Christ to be active, problem-solving entities that detect their challenges, solve their challenges, and fill the earth, just like they were commanded to do in Genesis chapter one. Creatures are not what? Passive modeling clay. Creatures are active, problem-solving entities. And that's what you are. So the next time you hear this stuff where the environment is molding and shaping, uh-uh-uh-uh. You shape yourself. You mold yourself. Creatures mold themselves. And I'd like you to remember this for the rest of your life. You are not passive modeling clay. You are active problem solving entities. And you will be reinforced with this if you come and visit this discovery center because I cannot cover enough of it now. But if you come and you take this in, you'll have the time to read and to study and make things fit in your mind as you go forward and prep yourself for taking off for college. Wow, that was all question number one. And as I did this debate, I'm watching the audience and I'm watching the people that I'm debating and there was silence because as I went through the mice and I went through the fish, the audience was saying, wow, wow, that's incredible. This clearly shows design, which sets this one up to discuss question number two because once once they have in their mind that these creatures really are designed and it's opened these cracks in their thinking that evolutionary theory is not only wrong, but it's, reading, it's leading them down the wrong track scientifically to interpret things, then we're ready to discuss question number two. And Sean McDowell actually snuck in two questions in question number two. Question number two says this, what is your take on Darwinian evolution? That's like question 2A and its compatibility with Christian faith? Well, here's a good answer to that question. It's, it, in fact, I know it's good because I wrote it. <laughs> Darwinian evolution is a weak scientific theory, and it is a poor explanation for the design we see in nature. Do you realize even evolutionists, they see that creatures look designed? 
They see that they fit their environment so well. So this design of creatures has to be answered. It must be addressed. They have a blind mechanistic explanation and we have an uh, explanation which shows purpose and planning and forethought that put it into it. And then second, question 2B, the answer is the basic premises of the theory cannot be reconciled and I added a word to Sean McDowell's question to biblical Christian faith. To biblical Christian faith. It can't be reconciled with that. Now why is it a weak scientific theory? Well, if you're going to talk about how creatures change and adapt, you better come up with a mechanism that can explain right from the very beginning, where did these creatures even come from? Or more fundamentally, where did life even come from? And do you realize that nobody, nobody on this planet has an explanation for the natural origin of life? You could write this down in your notes and it is a truism. There is not a scientific paper published anywhere on the planet that documents a natural origin of life. Now that is a really bold statement for me to stand up here and say. There's not a paper published anywhere on the planet which documents it, and that is the truth. I have gone to Harvard and stated that. I've gone to other major universities and stated that. I'm here, there may even be some skeptics in this audience right now. I'm saying there's not a paper published anywhere on this planet which documents it, and this is my challenge. If you find that paper, bring it to me, and I will change my statement. But it doesn't exist. And many of you have been bamboozled. You watch NOVA and National Geographic and all these shows and they, they kind of like give you the feeling that this has really been figured out. They're bluffing. They're bluffing you because it hasn't been figured out. And not only that, if you're going to explain the diversity of life, you must come up with a mechanism that enables a one creature to change into a fundamentally different kind. But what we and everybody on this planet has ever observed is that creatures faithfully reproduce after their kind. Faithfully reproduce after their kind. And you could write this down. There is not a scientific paper published anywhere on this planet which documents one creature changing into a fundamentally different kind of creature. And if you have that paper, bring it to me. And I'll change my statement. Now yesterday, as you were listening to Sean McDowell, he was talking about deconstructing your faith. Do you know what the very first step to deconstructing a person's faith is? It's this. It's for me as a professor or somebody to stand up in front of you and try to get you to deny what your very eyes and your senses are telling you. And it is happening today when people stand up to you and through bully tactics and through intimidation, they try to get you to say, boys are girls and girls are boys. And they want you to repeat it. And they want you to absorb it. That is the first step to see how far they can push you, how far they can push you to deny reality. And this is the second one. When the Bible says there was evening and morning day one, they want you to deny, oh, that doesn't look like a real day. And then this, everybody on this room here, you've seen animals reproduce and you know they always reproduce after their kind. They want to push you to deny what you see that somehow creatures can reproduce something other than their kind. These are all steps to deconstruct your faith and it begins by trying to get you to deny and to overrule what you know is true and what you can see and test to be true. And then once they've made that flip, once you've capitulated to flip where you'll say, no, boys really are girls, bang, they've got you. Because they can flip anything else after that point. And this is one of those major changes. Of course, we're told that similar features in creatures are due to their common descent, and yet you can see up on the screen that humans and squid, for instance, have a very similar eye, but our common ancestor, according to their scenario, wouldn't be back by hundreds of millions of years. And fish and mammals have similar features and other features. You realize that the genetics for the echolocation of a bat and a whale 
are identical to each other. And yet supposedly they've been separated for really long periods of time. They were wrong on that. They were wrong in all of their textbooks and they're still teaching this, that your appendix is a vestigial organ when we know that it has functions in your immune system. They were wrong when they said that that bone all of you are sitting on is a tailbone. When I know as a medical doctor that it is anchoring important muscles in your pelvic floor and I'm glad yours are working right now. And you are too. They're wrong when they look at little embryos that are developing and they say they have gill slits when we know scientifically that they never have gill tissue. They were totally wrong when they found DNA that they didn't know what its function was and they called it junk. Totally wrong on all of that. They were totally wrong when they said humans and chimps were 98, 99% genetically identical when we now know they're only about 80% identical. Their theory depends on tons of imagination. Look at that artist's rendition of what Lucy looks like on the right. If you put lipstick on her, you know, she'd look like an Oki in many ways on that. And yet what you see in the back and on the left are the bones. How many of you can see a lot of imagination between those bones on the left and the artist's rendition on the right? Well, that's the 1970s, nobody's doing it today, wrong. In 2015, Homo Naledi came out, the bones are on the right, the artist's reconstruction on the left. A lot of imagination. You shouldn't like scientific theories that depend on imagination. I would like to be sitting in this auditorium where the engineers relied on their imagination to determine the strength of the beams and the columns. Or how would you like to come to me as a medical doctor where I rely on my imagination to give you medications and things like that? That is why it is a weak scientific theory. But why is it incompatible with Christian faith? Well, these are two well-known atheists. Your parents were aware of them, Lois and Mary Leakey, they're dead now. But they wrote a book called Adam's Ancestor where they didn't even really believe in a real Adam. They believe that we are evolved creatures. And I can tell you this as a fact, there's not a dime's worth of difference between atheistic evolution and theistic evolution. They hold to the exact same mechanisms, the exact same explanations with the exact same outcomes. The theists just inject God into the picture, mystically and magically, which nobody can even detect. So why is it different? Well, the Bible tells us that how Adam was created was he was a direct creation by God. The Bible tells us that Adam was the first human being, and the Bible tells us that Adam and Eve were the first pair of human beings. And naturalistic evolutionists say the exact opposite that you can't even tell who Adam was, that there had to be a population of breeding pairs because you couldn't get the diversity of humans you have now if you just had a single couple. They are completely contradictory on all of those points. But this is the main one. The Bible tells us that there was a real man who really sinned, brought real death onto humanity, and therefore we needed a real savior who would be the second Adam, and that was the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us all of these things to be true, and they cannot be reconciled with each other. The next two are also important. The evolutionary review it is, is built on natural selection, survival of the fittest. It is a death-driven worldview, and it always will be a death-driven worldview. In fact, Stephen Jobs says that death is probably the single best invention of life because it was life's change agent as he was dying of pancreatic cancer. Now, as you look what's on the left-hand side of the screen, many of you have probably made peace with that. But that's not right. And that is gross and that is ugly. The Bible doesn't say that death is life's best invention. The Bible says that death is an enemy. The Bible says that death is a curse. And the Bible says there will be a day when the Lord Jesus Christ returns and death, real death, physical death, will be eliminated forever. And we should all be looking forward to that day. In addition to that, what you see on the screen here are some gears. Those are real gears. In fact, those are microscopic gears. You gotta have a microscope to see them. And they're in the left, the hind legs of that little plant hopper there in the left-hand corner of the screen. That plant hopper can launch itself from zero to 700 Gs, 700 Gs. 
And its legs need to extend at the same time. And the Lord Jesus, who designed this creature, connected him at the back with a pair of real mechanical gears so that they work at the same time. Now, when you see that and you conclude that those were designed, that there was a real gear maker who made those gears, that is a rational decision. Evolutionary thinking would say, no, no, no. Deny reality. Deny what your eyes see. And believe that those things were cobbled together by a blind watchmaker over a long period of time through random genetic mistakes of broken things that got you those gears. The Bible says it's reasonable and rational to conclude when you see gears that there was a gear maker, a real gear maker. Evolutionary thinking is a major step in the part of deconstructing your faith where you will be able to deny, and they try to get you to deny what your eyes are clearly telling you are true. Boys are boys, girls are girls, and these are gears. Hmm. That's why it's incompatible with biblical Christian faith. Many reasons why we can't bring these two together, which then brings us to the last question, and an important one, one that you will have to deal with Somebody's going to ask you this when you go off to college. Maybe even your friends in your neighborhood will ask you this. As they read through Genesis, they're going to say, well, well, what do you think? What do you think? What do you think about Genesis 1 and 2? How do you understand and how do you interpret Genesis 1 and 2? What's your interpretation of Genesis 1 and 2? This is really important. You need a mechanism. You need, a, you need an explanation for that. So here's a great answer. Genesis 1 and 2 are historical narratives, real history. I, if you're taking notes, underline that. The history in Genesis begins in Genesis 1, not Genesis 12. Genesis 1 and 2 are real history, not mytho history, as William Lane Craig says, not an allegory. It is real history to be really understood right from the beginning. Real history, that's the debate. Is what you're reading, is this real historical record? Do you know as you read through the Bible, the Bible says for Moses to write these things down, write it down. And then second, it's real history of how God created. And then how do I interpret? Well, and I got a degree at Moody Bible Institute in theology and they said, I give words their normal meaning in their normal context. Just like you do every other area of life. Every other area of life. How would you like me as a medical doctor to write you a prescription? And it says, take a medication by mouth two times a day. Take a medication by mouth two times a day. You take your prescription to the pharmacist and the pharmacist says, well, what does Dr. Galuza mean by mouth? Mouth of a river, mouth of a cave. What in the world is he talking about? So he changes your prescription to say, take this medication by a natural opening two times a day. Hmm. What I mean by mouth is this, the mouth. And then before I went to medical school, I was an engineer and I did a contract in Guam where a contractor was rehabbing some, some barracks. And as part of the rehabbing project, the contract, the contract said, contractor will apply two coats of paint. Well, this contractor came out, applied one coat of paint on all the rooms and then demobilized on all of that. He wasn't giving words their normal meaning. In fact, he said this, when we caught him on it, he says, look at there at the bottom right. The contract means one coat of paint thick enough to equal two coats of paint. And he had put on a thick coat. And we told the contractor, no, what the contract means is two coats of paint, and this went to court. Who do you think won? That, that, you know, that contractor who would jip out the government, or do you think the government won? This one, the government won, and this is what the judge said in his decision. In contract law, words must be construed to what? Their normal meaning in the context of the specification, otherwise the intended intentions of either party becomes unknowable. Translated to this, if you 
can make words mean whatever you want them to mean to suit your purposes, if you can do that to the words, then the contract is worthless. And I would suggest as we treat the Bible, if someone takes the words of the Bible and misconstrues them to suit their purposes, then the Bible is essentially worthless to us. Even if you believe it's inspired, even if you believe it's inerrant, if someone can take the words and change those words and their meaning, then you don't have a, a Bible which can be your guide in your life. And I told you that it was actual real history. This is a study, I'm not a Hebrew scholar, but some Hebrew scholars looked at the grammar of Hebrew poetry and the grammar of real historical biblical texts and they can actually plot that grammar. This is a scientific way of looking at it. And Genesis 1 and 2 plots right up there with historical narratives. Not with poetry, not with allegory, but with historical narratives. But we just celebrated, just a couple days ago, Reformation Day. Now, we don't talk about the Reformation a lot, but it was really important. These guys on the screen and thousands and thousands, literally millions of your Christian forefathers and foremothers gave their lives for some major issues. And one of the major issues was this. At the time before the Reformation, the church was telling people, and this applies to all of you in the room, that you, you yourselves, none of you can understand the Bible for yourself. That there had to be a holy man, a priest, who would come in and they would tell you what the Bible says. You were incapable of doing it. It was a mystical book, you couldn't understand it, and that we had to tell you the words of the Bible. Well, the people in the Reformation, they completely disagreed with that. And this was an important point. They said, no, the words are inherently clear. Anybody with a good translation, you, you in the pew, you students, you young people, you can understand it for yourself. You do not need a holy man to come and tell you what the Bible says. And they based that on certain biblical texts. And John, up there, the Lord Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes, the Holy Spirit will lead you into all truth. In Deuteronomy, at the end of the Old Testament, Moses said, you don't have to have someone come across the ocean to tell you what the words I gave just said, but they're near you and they're in your heart. And in Acts chapter 17, the Bereans, who were more noble than the Thessalonians, when the apostle Paul was preaching and teaching to them, average, ordinary people used their Bible to check and see if what the apostle Paul was said was true. And these reformers said, this is an authority issue. If you're here and the Bible is here, the Bible is your authority. But when you insert another person between you and the Bible, that priest becomes your authority and not the Bible. The priest becomes the authority and not the Bible. So they saw this as an important issue. And this was an important part of the Reformation. They said, you do not need a holy man to tell you you know what? You can understand the Bible for yourself and you need no, zero, here's an important point to write down. You need no outside information in order to understand that Bible. What you need is in the Bible. It's there. It's there and it's really important. And you don't need a science guy to tell you what the Bible says either particularly when they're atheistic science guys, when you insert their interpretations between the Bible and you, they become your authority and not the Bible. Foot stomping point. When you insert interpretive filters between you and the Bible, they become your authority. You don't need them. And a poll was done in 2008 of literally 20,000 Christians, Bible-believing Christians, and they looked, at, uh, they looked at a whole range of ages. And I just want to look at the age range of 20 to 30 years old. That's almost your age range. It's a little bit older than you now, but those are the people at your age range. And what they found from this poll was this. Of the 20 to 30 year olds, 95% of those people had faithfully attended church and Sunday school when they were in elementary and middle school. But by the time they got to high school, and we're not talking about those who are going to Christian schools like you. Only half were faithfully attending. And by the time they went to college, only essentially one out of 10 
This is alarming. That means people like you. They no longer attend. And why? The reason they gave, the main reason they gave is this. They no longer believed that the biblical accounts were real history and really true. That was the main reason. They just stopped believing their Bible. And an important fact that came out in this study is this. About 40% began having questions, not in college, not in high school, but in junior high school. 40% of Bible-believing young people just like you began to doubt in junior high school. Another 45% began to doubt their Bible seriously in high school. And just the remainder, the tiny fraction that remained began to pick up their doubts in college. You know what that's saying? That's saying when young people like you have questions, we as a church had better have answers. You have questions, we better have answers, and that is the whole purpose of this biblical worldview conference that you're here. You have questions, we have answers. You bring us your questions, we will give you the answers. When the church looks like it's it's this, you have your questions and we run away because we don't have any answers. You doubt, you reject the Bible, you leave the faith. So when you have questions, we better have answers. And you know what? One of these days, all of you will be a Sunday school teacher. So you better have answers when your younger people have questions for you. And you can tell them that anybody, even these Alka Indians, can pick up their Bible, they can read it for themselves, and they can understand it. And if you really want to equip yourselves, because I know you're not going to remember everything I'm saying today, you need to get out to our table and sign up for this absolutely free magazine. We have donors who will make sure you get this free. And it will keep you current on the scientific issues. It'll keep you current on the best answers that are coming out today. And you can subscribe to this YouTube channel. We're putting out some of the best, best movies and videos and podcasts to answer your questions. You have questions, the answers are there. Make the effort to get that information. Sign up for this free publication. I can tell you it literally changed my life when I was 20 years old, and it'll equip you. Go out to the back to our table and sign up for this. And then finally, the major reason for giving words their normal meaning in their normal context is that the Lord Jesus did it, the apostles did it. When someone asked the Lord Jesus, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He went right back to them. He said, have you not read? Have you not read that from the beginning of creation? And then he's going to quote from Genesis 1. And then he's going to quote from Genesis 2 equally. God made them male and female. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife. And the two shall be one flesh. The Lord Jesus going right back to the original creation, giving words their normal meaning and their normal context, equates Genesis 1 and 2 together. And then the Apostle Paul, speaking of basically the resurrection of the dead, he points this out. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. He was referring back to a real Adam who really lived, who brought real sin and real death. The Lord Jesus accepted the words normally in Genesis 1 and 2. The apostle Paul did and all the other apostles. So we should as well. We should as well. And there, very quickly, are three great answers to three really important questions. Questions that you're going to face. But there's really another question that's really important as well. And it's just, it goes right back to this Adam thing that Paul was talking about. The question bases on this fact. In this world, there's only two groups of people. Just two groups of people. And it's not smart people and dumb people. It's not pretty people and ugly people. It's not white people. It's not black people. There's only two groups of people. Those people who are in Adam lost, dead in their sins, without hope, 
without any hope of eternity. And those people who are in Christ, who have been born again, forgiven, regenerated, with a hope of eternal life. You're either in Adam or you're in Christ. That's it. So the question is, where are you today? Are you still in Adam or are you now in Christ? I can speak on behalf of everybody who's organized this conference, the pastors of these churches that have represented here and the pastor of this church today. Come to Christ and he will give you life. Thank you very much for your time.